Hello students, my name is Abhishek Sudhir and I am an assistant professor at the Zindal Global Law School. Welcome to EPG Patshala. Today we will be discussing module 5, Genesis of the Right to Free Speech and Expression, which is part of the paper on civil and political rights. This module will introduce you to the significant theoretical and political discourse that has developed on the right to free speech and expression. We will begin by looking at the theoretical underpinnings of the doctrine of free speech and expression. The module will survey the literature on the philosophical foundations of the right. The module will also introduce you to the Constituent Assembly debates. The Constituent Assembly, as some of you might know, was elected to frame a constitution for then the then newly independent Indian nation. The module will not only introduce you to the debates, but will also go in depth into the debates on free speech and expression. It will as it will provide a sound basis for understanding the development of the right to free speech and expression in India. The purpose of this module is twofold. The first purpose, the first objective, is to give the students an overview of the theoretical underpinnings of the right to free speech. The second objective is to help the students understand the development of the right in the Indian context by introducing them to the Constituent Assembly debates. Let's start now with the political theory behind the freedom of speech doctrine. John Stuart Mill, one of the most famous philosophers, came up with something known as the harm principle. But before going into the harm principle, let's look at how J.S. Mill defined free speech. Mill, in his famous work, On Liberty, strongly advocates for free speech. He argues that free speech is imperative for intellectual and social progress. He contends that even a false opinion is more productive. As a silenced opinion contains no element of truth simply because it was never expressed. Think about this carefully. Would you rather that an individual says something that is patently false, patently untrue, or would you prefer it that he never said it at all? This is the fundamental conflict for advocates that rages between advocates of absolute free speech and those who believe speech should be restricted. Advocates of absolute free speech believe that any opinion, howsoever patently false or untrue, should not be curbed in any way. Was Mill an absolutist when it came to free speech? We will answer that question subsequently when we explore the harm principle. But for now, we can say safely that John Stuart Mill set the bar very high when it came to free speech and believed that even an opinion that people might think is ludicrous should be allowed to be expressed. Mill placed a premium on open debate as he did not want people to accept the truth, the truth in quotes, because it is told to them that this is truth. According to Mill, individuals should come to a conclusion on their own. What is being said is true or untrue. Think about it. All Mill wants to say here is very simple. If a particular individual believes that an opinion is false, he should come to that conclusion independently based on the merits of the opinion that is being expressed. Now, let us say that someone says, all monkeys are stupid. Now, that might seem like a statement to certain individuals as being true. It might seem to certain individuals as being false. Some might believe that there is no right or wrong answer. But for Mill, a person should not be allowed, should be allowed rather, to say that all monkeys are stupid, even if a majority of the populace believes that that statement is untrue. Essentially, it boils down to this. Should the state be allowed to curb free speech? Because it is the state that represents the views of the majority of the populace. Therefore, a few actors, a few individuals who constitute the state and its various organs will have to take a decision on what kind of speech is permissible and what kind of speech is impermissible. Mill contends that even if only one individual expresses a dissent on a particular proposition, then he shall also be allowed the same liberty to speak his mind as any other. So for Mill, even if a billion Indians believe that Sachin Tendulkar is the greatest cricketer and one Indian believes that no, Rahul Dravid is the greatest cricketer, then that one Indian who is dissenting on the view of the majority 
should be allowed to express his opinion, even if the majority believes that statement to be patently false. That is at the core of Mill's theory on free speech. Now, let's look at what Mill had to say on free speech. Mill, in his own words, defines the limit of free speech by using the harm principle. Here's how he defines the harm principle. And I quote, The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Let's go back to our example of Sachin Tendulkar and Rahul Dravid. Now, a majority of Indians believe Sachin Tendulkar is the greatest cricketer. One Indian believes that no, Rahul Dravid is the greatest cricketer. So the question is, this one Indian, by expressing his view that Rahul Dravid is the greatest cricketer, is he causing any harm to others? So again, the necessary corollary to that is how do you define harm? Is harm simply hurting the sentiments of another person? Is harm simply hurting the sentiments of a billion or so Indians who believe that Sachin Tendulkar is the greatest cricketer? Does that harm justify the denial of that individual's free speech? The right of that individual to say that Rahul Dravid is a better cricketer than Sachin Tendulkar. That is at the core of John Stuart Mill's harm principle. Mill uses the example of a corn deal. Mill explains the harm principle using the example of a corn dealer. He writes that if one writes on a piece of paper that corn dealers are responsible for starving the poor and circulate it, this should be allowed. So let us assume that there is no famine and everybody is well fed. But there are a small section of the populace who are starving. An individual writing for a newspaper says, that corn dealers are responsible for the poor starving. According to Mill, such speech should be allowed. Then he twists the hypothetical, twists the example a little bit. He says, on the other hand, if an angry mob comprising of starving poor is standing outside the house of a corn dealer and a person tells them it is because of this corn dealer that they are starving, while he, the corn dealer, lives a prosperous life. It should not be allowed. Think about it. Mill tries to draw a distinction here between the two types of speech. In the first instance, someone is writing on a piece of paper. There is no harm, or should we say there is no immediacy of harm. There is no imminent threat to the life of the corn dealer or the well-being of the corn dealer. But if there is an angry mob of starving poor standing outside the house of a corn dealer. A person then tells them that it is because of this corn dealer who is inside the house living a prosperous life. It's because of him that they are starving. Then Mill says that such speech should not be allowed. And this is what he calls his harm principle. Mill distinguishes the two scenarios. As in the former act, there is no threat to the corn dealer by the statement. While in the latter, there is an imminent threat to life and the property of the corn dealer. The crowd might just get excited by one of these words, may turn into a vigilante mob, and harm may ensue to the corn dealer. Now, one of Mill's critics is Joel Feinberg. And Joel Feinberg came up with something known as the offense principle. Now, Joel Feinberg's offense principle is a critique of the harm principle. Feinberg is of the belief that the harm people raises the bar too high. He argues that if only those offences are prohibited which cause harm to other individuals, it will be inconsistent with various existing criminal prohibitions. Now think about it. An individual makes a statement that members of a particular community are all thieves and must all be sent to prison. Under J.S. Mill's harm principle, that speech should be allowed. The individual, by making that statement, is not exactly causing any harm to others. He, there is no immediacy of threat to those other individuals. Some might argue that this might just be the rantings of a lunatic. So why prohibit him from expressing, as we go back to Mill's earlier claim, of from expressing a false opinion? Let him express that false opinion and let the people 
who hear that opinion make up their mind about whether it's right or wrong now let us assume that this same individual is standing outside a place of religious worship of a particular minority community he is standing outside that place of worship of that minority community there is a angry mob in front of him that angry mob wants to go inside the place of worship and attack the worshipers the person there is egging them on and he is blaming that minority community for all the ills of society under mills harm principle that statement should not be allowed because there is an immediacy of threat but under feinberg's offense principle the situation will not even get to that stage because under feinberg's offense principle the making of that statement itself would amount to hate speech and that would violate various provisions in india for example of the indian penal code and would be a criminal prohibition that kind of speech is criminally prohibited in india by the indian penal code feinberg argues that it is always a good reason in support of a proposed criminal prohibition that it would probably be an affecting effective way of preventing serious offence as opposed to injury or harm to persons other than the actor and that it is probably a necessary means to that end let let's go through that again it is always a good reason in support of a proposed criminal prohibition that it would probably be an effective way of preventing serious offence look at the words he uses serious offence as opposed to harm or injury to persons other than the actor and that probably is a necessary means to that end for fine work that individual outside the place of religious worship were to make the same statement say in a newspaper or a news channel that statement should still be disallowed for feinberg because it causes serious offense never mind the lack of an immediate threat the offense principle essentially for feinberg helps in censoring speech and expression that may escape persecution under the harm principle let's take the example for naked man walking down the road a naked man walking down the road is he causing any harm to others is there any immediacy of threat as long as he is not attacking anyone he is going about his business only problem is he is not wearing any clothes for feinberg a man walking naked in public cannot be prosecuted under the harm principle but can be prosecuted under the offense principle how can he be prosecuted under the offense principle so this is how he explains how the individual can be prosecuted it is always a good reason in support of a proposed criminal pro- prohibition that it would probably be an effective way of preventing serious offense to persons other than the actor and that it is probably a necessary means to that end the principle asserts in effect that the prevention of offensive conduct is properly the state's business so it is the interest of the, in the interest of the state which represents a majority of the populace which represents those individuals on the street who are looking at this naked man it is properly their business to prevent offense and not just offense serious offense so feinberg argues that the naked man is not causing harm but he is causing serious offense to the individuals who have to look at him without any cl- with, because he is not wearing any clothes for mill that person should be allowed to walk down the street naked because he's not causing any harm and his way of his act of not wearing any clothes is his way of expressing himself and should be allowed because there is no harm this is the tension between feinberg and mill and this is pretty much at the core of the free speech debate now what is the scope and ambit of feinberg's principle feinberg's principle is not an absolute prohibition on every kind of material that may offend anyone now those of us in india know that we have a banning culture in this country anything that remotely offends the sentiments or the sensibilities of a small section of the community will be banned for feinberg things that may offend a person and could be avoided by that person should not be banned for example let us take the recent controversy over the film msg messenger of god there was a lot of controversy over that film people wanted that film banned 
the censor board initially banned it and then the ban was revoked and the film was released. Now, for Feinberg, that film may be causes offence, maybe even serious offence. But even for Feinberg, that film should not have been banned. Why? Because it could have been avoided by the person. Essentially, people had control. They could have gone to the multiplex or the cinema and watched the film if they wanted to. If they didn't want to, they didn't have to watch it. They were not subject to that film. Unlike the naked man who walks down the street. Those who are at the, on the street at that moment don't have a say, don't have a choice in the matter. That is the difference. So even for Feinberg, it doesn't mean that anything that offends should be banned. Now let's look at some of the weaknesses or shall we say the inconsistencies in Feinberg's principle. Let's look at the recent controversy over Wendy Doniger's book, The Hindus. It's common knowledge that a Hindu might find that recent book offensive. But for Feinberg, rather than getting the book banned, they should avoid reading it. This is because if we ban the book, it goes against the very principle of free speech and one should not prohibit something until and unless it cannot be avoided. But the problem with Feinberg's principle is there is a slippery slope and you have to think about this critically. Feinberg is setting the standard, the bar at offence. He says, yes, if it offends, you should ban it. But then he says, if you can avoid it, don't ban it. Who determines what can and cannot be avoided? Well, at the end of the day, it is the state. And the state is democratically elected, in India at least. And if the state is democratically elected, it depends on individuals, its citizens for votes. So if a section of that community is offended by a particular book that they can easily avoid or a particular film that they can easily avoid, but they still want it banned, the state will probably give it. It is here that we see the tension between Mill and Feinberg and why Feinberg sets the bar too low. Conversely, Feinberg says, Mill sets the bar too high. Feinberg's offence principle in comparison to Mill's harm principle, some might argue, is much better suited to the temperament of democracies like India. Perhaps Feinberg's theory is a justification, or offers a justification rather, for the Indian state's overzealous approach when it comes to curbing speech and expression. But to say that it is better suited is something that one has to think about carefully. Undoubtedly in India, the freedom of speech is comparatively restricted, unlike nations such as the United States, where the right to freedom of speech is near absolute. So that's some food for thought on the theory behind free speech. Now we come to the Constituent Assembly debates on freedom of speech and expression in India. The members of the assembly who are not elected by universal adult suffrage but were indirectly elected by provincial assemblies. They began the difficult task of making the constitution on December 9th, 1946 and concluded on November 26th, 1949, a long and arduous process. Much of the debates focusing on free speech and expression took place on the 1st and 2nd December 1948 and the 16th and 17th of October, 1949. Article 19 of the present constitution was Article 13 of the then draft constitution. Article 13 of the draft constitution guaranteed to each citizen the right to free speech and expression, but this would not prevent the state from making any law abridging this freedom in so far as it related to libel, slander, defamation, contempt of court or any other matter which offended against decency or morality or which undermined the security of or tends to overthrow the state. What this essentially means is the right to free speech and expression in India is not absolute. The restrictive content of this clause was in question on the floor of the assembly. In Damodar Swarup Seth's opinion, it was clear that the rights guaranteed in Article 13 had become non-existent by the restrictions placed in that very section and at the mercy of the high-handedness of the legislature. No change was made with regard to restrictions placed on the freedom of speech. B. R. Ambedkar explained why, and I quote, What the draft constitution has done is that instead of formulating fundamental rights in absolute terms and depending upon our Supreme Court, 
to come to the rescue of parliament by inventing the doctrine of police power. It permits the state directly to impose limitations upon the fundamental rights. There is really no difference in the result. What one does directly, the other does indirectly. In both cases, the fundamental rights are not absolute. So, B. R. Ambedkar makes it absolutely clear that the fundamental rights are not absolute and they can be curbed. Thus, Article 13 1 guaranteed the freedom of speech and expression. But later, it gave the right to the legislature, in the interest of the general public, to formulate any law which may not be in accordance with the article or may curtail the rights in the article. Therefore, you have the right to free speech and expression. But you cannot exercise that right in a manner that would tend to overthrow the Indian state. Therefore, if you stand outside parliament and or with a loudspeaker say, fellow citizens, let us take up arms against the Indian state. That speech is not permitted because it tends to or it overthrows or tends to overthrow the state. Let me explain this a little further. Now, the state gives you rights and says your right is A. But the state says your right to do A can be restricted in the interests of B, C, D, E, F and G. So the question is, is there any value left in the right that the state grants for us to do A? The question arose in the assembly, who will judge what is in the interest of the general public? Who will judge what kind of speech should be restricted and what kind of speech should not be restricted? The restrictions levied upon the article were highly resented. But a majority of the assembly was of the opinion that the freedom of speech and expression could not be absolute. Especially they felt in a country like India, something we hear said often in a country like India. There was a need to strike a fine balance between individual liberty on the one hand and social control. Where to draw the line? That was the question that the assembly grappled with. Alladi Krishnaswami Iyer spoke eloquently in the backdrop of the bloody events of partition. Iyer explained why rights such as free speech could not be absolute. And I quote, The recent happenings in different parts of India have convinced me more than ever that all the fundamental rights guaranteed under the constitution must be subject to public order, security and safety. Though such a provision may to some extent neutralize the effect of the fundamental rights guaranteed under the constitution. All of you must remember that the constitution was being drafted when there was bloodshed and violence all around. Partition of Punjab. Partition of Bengal, two communities at loggerheads. In that environment, members of the assembly were very uneasy about granting absolute free speech and expression. Alladi Krishna Swami Iyer was supported by C. Rajgopalachari, who argued that fundamental peace and orderly progress of the country, dependent upon communal peace and harmony, peace between communities. And therefore, speeches and utterances which were likely to foster communal hatred must be prevented as a matter of necessity. Essentially, Raj Gopalachari insisted that hate speech be given no constitutional protection. There was, however, a divergence of opinion. Kanaya Lal Maneklal Munshi disagreed with Ayer and Raj Gopalachari. He stressed that the practice of all civilized countries and the opinion of all constitutional experts was in favour of permitting freedom of public expression, even tending to class or communal hatred up to the point where it led to a breach of the peace of public order. So we go back again to the example of the man standing outside the place of religious worship of a minority community. For Kanayalal Maneklal Munshi, it should be permitted right up until that point, wherein there was going to be a breach of the peace of public order. And if those utterances were going to lead, or as a direct consequence of that utterance, there was going to be a breach of the peace or a public order problem, then that speech should be disallowed. Now let's look at the word morality. The state can restrict free speech and expression in the interests of morality. What is morality? That is an age-old question. And probably a question that will never be answered till the end of time. There was some dissatisfaction with the use of this word morality. 
KT Shah was very critical, the barrister from Brazil, of the term morality. In his view, the word morality was very vague and its connotation changed substantially from time to time. He opined that in a land of many religions with different conceptions of morality, different customs, usages and ideals, it would be nigh on impossible to ascertain what constituted morality. He stated that if it was not to degenerate into the tyranny of the majority, it was necessary either to define more clearly what was meant by the term morality or drop it altogether. Now let me explain. A particular section of the community believes that A is moral. A particular section of the community believes B is moral. But if A is moral, B is immoral. And if B is moral, A is immoral. Who decides whether A or B is moral or whether both are immoral or one of them is moral? This was the problem KT Shah was hinting at. Now, some might believe in this country that premarital intercourse, premarital sex is immoral. Some might believe that premarital sex is moral. Who decides? In a democracy, it has to be parliament. But this was the problem. KT Shah felt that it was left to parliament. Then what is moral and what is immoral will be determined by the views of the majority, by the views of what the majority believes. And the views of what the majority believes will be embodied in the laws passed by parliament, their elected representatives. Now the question is, is democracy rule of the majority? It certainly is ruled by majority. But is it rule of the majority to the detriment of the minority? And this was the worry KT Shah had. He felt that what the majority considered moral would be permissible. And any speech that tended to encourage or promote something that the majority considered immoral would get no constitutional protection. The next issue that came up for consideration was with regard to the use of the word expression. The word expression was considered to have a wider meaning. According to KD Shah, expression and speech should have been running parallel to each other. But he also added that expression also includes pictorial and other types of expression and not merely the speech. And his consideration was taken into account. And free speech and expression has been given a very wide interpretation by the Supreme Court, as we shall see in future modules. Now, coming to the all-important issue of the freedom of the press, an important question was raised by Katie Shah again on the omission of the freedom of the press. In the United States Constitution, freedom of the press is explicitly guaranteed. Katie Shah opined that the freedom of the press was a very important part of the clause. And he believed that it should not have been misunderstood as a license to publish whatever the publisher deems fit if it led to misuse of that liberty. And he believed that the ultimate omission of the freedom of the press from the free speech clause, Article 19 of today's constitution, is not an, was not an apt decision considering the making of the constitution and the fundamental rights. All of Katie Shah's fears were put to rest by B.R. Ambedkar again the architect of the constitution. B.R. Ambedkar explained why there was no need to explicitly guarantee the freedom of the press. Now, let us take the example of the Times of India. Does the Times of India have the right to free speech and expression? The Times of India is an entity. But at the end of the day, the Times of India is a company. Now, the worry K.T. Shah had was that free speech and expression was guaranteed to citizens but not to that company. Now, let us take the case of Ornav Goswami, the anchor of the news hour on Times Now. Does Ornav Goswami have the right to free speech and expression? The answer very clearly, emphatically is yes. Now, can Ornav Goswami express himself freely on the 9 o'clock news? Yes, he can and he does so on a daily basis. Where does he get this right from? Well, according to B.R. Ambedkar, the freedom of the press, the freedom of the media is implicit in the free speech and expression guaranteed to an individual, 
Therefore, an individual who was a member of the press had the freedom to express his opinions much like any other individual. Subject, of course, to the provisions of the constitution. That is where the press gets, it right, gets its right to free speech and expression from, from the individuals that staff it. There was also some controversy surrounding the use of the word sedition. Those of you who follow the news regularly will be well aware of this word. Sedition is defined as all those practices, whether by word or deed or writing, which are calculated to disturb the tranquility of the state and lead ignorant persons to subvert the government. This clause, this offence rather of sedition, this section of the Indian Penal Code has been repeatedly invoked and was repeatedly invoked during the freedom struggle to imprison many of our freedom fighters. And many of them who are now in the assembly were fundamentally opposed to the use of this word. They felt the criticism of a district magistrate was considered a sedition. An officer of the union, criticizing him or her was considered sedition. But the members of the assembly were very clear in the, their mind that this use of the word sedition the, uh, would not work in a democratic form of government. Criticism of the government should be welcomed and not considered a sedition was the overwhelming and most prevailing view in the assembly. It was stated that the essence of the democracy, essence of a democracy, is its criticism and added that the word sedition in the clause would be a big hindrance to the freedom of speech and expression. And subsequently, the word sedition was removed from the constitution. But unfortunately, as we see, governments of the day continue to invoke sedition to clamp down on free speech and expression. And now coming to Article 19, 1, 192 of the constitution as they stand today. Protection of certain rights regarding the freedom of speech, etc. All citizens shall have the right to free speech, freedom of speech and expression. Nothing in subclause A of clause 1 shall affect the operation of any existing law or prevent the state from making any law in so far as such law imposes reasonable restrictions on the exercise of the right conferred by the said subclause in the interest of the sovereignty and integrity of India. The security of the state, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, decency or morality or in relation to contempt of court defamation or incitement to an offence. The government of the day, led by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, justified the wording of Article 19.1 and 19.2 as follows. Certain difficulties have been brought to light by judicial decisions and pronouncements, especially in regard to the chapter on fundamental rights, said Pandit Nehru. The citizen's right to free speech and expression guaranteed by Article 19.1a has been held by some courts to be so comprehensive as not to render a person culpable even if he advocates murder and other crimes of violence. In other countries with written constitutions, free speech and freedom of the press is not regarded as debarring the state from punishing or preventing abuse of the freedom. So we can see that Article 19.1 and 19.2 is more Joel Feinberg and less John Stuart Mill. It's interesting to note that Article 19.1 and 19.2 has not been amended since 1951 and the onus has now shifted to the judiciary to determine the scope and extent of the right to free speech and expression. How the judiciary has managed this task is something we will consider in the modules to come. So students, let us recap on what we've learned in this module. The debates on free speech was significant. It was the one fundamental right that formed the very basis of the freedom movement. Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, all of them were punished for what they said and what they wrote. All of them understood the importance of this right and they reflected their understanding in the manner in which Article 19, 1 and 2 were drafted. Unfortunately, once Pandit Nehru and his comrades came to government, they realized that there is more to governance and certain types of free speech and expression had to be curbed. That being said, it was necessary to deliberate on the extent to which it was to be constitutionally guaranteed, whether it should be absolute or restrictive. If restrictive, then till what extent should it be restrictive? We've seen that we've seen and examined this deliberative process and how the constitution makers decided to give the citizenry the freedom of speech and expression, albeit with restrictions. And this right was long denied by the people of India by the erstwhile colonial rulers. And it's a matter of pride today 
that despite all its shortcomings, the article still forms the very heart and soul of our Constitution.